All right, so has everybody turned in their homework assignment? Every group has submitted. Uh, Before I go into paper, have any questions about uh, virtual memory, cache co uh, coherency, and cache consistency, right through, right back, um, Snoopy, bus, and dictionary, book to dictionary. Do you remember how the cycles update, if some variables change, uh, between multi processes? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You're talking about here? This one? Okay. So this is dictionary protocol. Yeah, you know, this is Snoopy bus, right? So the Snoopy bus here is using. Actually, this is a better figure to kind of look at. Stand it out. So what's going on here is we have a processor and cache. Each processor has its own local copy of the cache, right? And it has its own local copy of data memory. And it actually has, we're going to be, section eight, we're going to be going over uh, input output. Um, and each has its own directory. Now, this interconnection network contains the Snoopy bus. Now, the whole thing goes on. When one of these processors is, you know, let's say this processor here at the very end contains a copy of the variable, as does this one and this one. So let's say these three do. And so, and currently, they're all the value is four. So we perform an add i operation, i plus plus, it now becomes five. So what happens is the directory is updated. So this is the most recent time it's been updated. And then the Snoopy bus is going to be checking to see if any directory has been updated. When it is, it says, hey, this one's been updated here. What I need to do. Is any, is, do you have one? No. Do you have one? No. Do you have one? Yes. What's your current value? Four? Okay, now I need to go through the whole local hierarchy and update this before you perform any other operation to ensure. Same thing. Let's going to go to this one. This, this is the other one that had one. Do you have it? Yes. What's your current value? Four. I'll change it to five. So that's what's known as write through and validate. Okay. So another challenge that we have in multiprocessing is the concept of branching. So before, I mean, we have to do this as well in you know, single processors like you guys are doing in your final project. You have to worry about branch prediction, this concept of branch prediction. What this means is if you're doing a while loop or for loop or an uh, if statement, right? You would have, you're going to make a branch, but you don't know about whether or not you're going to branch until the moment you actually get there in the code, right? Because you don't know what that physical value is going to be updated to. For, for the project that you guys are working on, you actually have the values loaded into the data memory. But what happens if we're just doing basic you know, coding and it asks you for an input, so it's in, insert an integer, you put in six, that so value six is then put into your branch condition. So you don't know until runtime whether or not you're actually going to branch or not. So what do we do if we want to improve performance, especially in multiprocessors? Well, we could wait and then do the branch. But oftentimes, in your multiprocessors, you'll get to the branch before you actually have the physical value, because maybe the physical value is being calculated in another, multiproce in another processor. So what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to guess whether or not we're going to branch. And then we're going to discuss how we make the guess and then what, what we're going to do if the guess is wrong. Because if we, we guess wrong, well, it's wrong, okay, well, whatever, I'm not going to do that code, then I need you to do the code because that's what the program says, right? So this concept of branch prediction, I, mean, I basically kind of alluded to everything here, but branch predictor attempts to avoid this waste of time by trying to guess whether the conditional jump is likely to be taken or not taken. So those are the two terms in branch prediction. <clears throat> so taken means you're going to take the branch, meaning I'm going to jump past all the code, and not taken means I'm going to do the code inside the uh, in, inside loop. So this is a simple example here. We have an if statement. 
we have this if i equals l, j plus plus, and then k plus j. So we have branch not equal, right? So it's going to compare <laughs> 1 and 5, right? And then if I do branch, if I don't branch, I want to add increment j. Otherwise, I'm going to increment k, right? And so this becomes an issue because we can't, we can't be sure what j is going to be in this next instruction, right? So if we do a branch prediction, we branch, predict branch taken, that means we would go straight to k plus j. And if we're right, we can just continue on the code. But let's say we predict the branch, and then we start continuing the operations, and then we find out, oh, no, actually, i was equal to 1. We needed to do that. We need something called a reordering buffer to take us back to the place where the branch occurred, do the proper code, and continue. Now, the branch prediction mechanisms, uh, we're not going to really go into them too terribly deeply in this course. Uh, branch prediction is typically discussed at uh, advanced computer architecture, typically it's a grad level. But what we're going to discuss is some method called two-level br uh, branch prediction. So uh, the first thing, we're, this is what's known as dynamic branch prediction. So the first topical guide objective for today is the difference between static and, bran and dynamic branch prediction. Static branch prediction is basically you take information that you have at compile time and you make your branch prediction based on that information. Dynamic branch prediction utilizes hardware within the uh, processor to actually dynamically predict based on previous results. So if let's say I predict branch taken and it was right, then I would just stay there in the finite state machine. Otherwise, I go to branch not taken. So it's one bit branch prediction would be going like this. Is it, did I predict correctly? Yes, then I stay there. Did I predict incorrectly? I go to the other state. So the issue is we want it to be very accurate, right? We want it predicted most of the time, right? If it's not, we only want to use this reordering buffer in instances where the case is not there, and we want that to be minimal. So we're going to take advantage of the principle of locality. Elements in memory tend to be accessed, and elements around them, temporal and spatial locality, allows us to be able to pretty accurately predict branches, basically using this you know, concept called hysteresis, meaning that we take information just recently used and use that to make a prediction. So static branch prediction is defined here. It uses information that was gathered before the execution of the program, before compile time. It's going to take what you had in your instruction memory and data memory that you just did in project two and use that to try to predict. Dynamic branch prediction uses information about taken or not taken branches gathered at runtime to predict the outcome of the branch. So you're going to use a finite state machine, which we're going to discuss here in a minute, to do that. I'm going to scroll up a little bit for those in the back. So the idea of a two-bit branch prediction buffer. So the reason it's called a two-bit branch prediction is because it has four states, so we're going to need state 0, state 1, state 2, and state 3. So we need two bits to represent all four states in the finite state machine. So there's four states. Predict taken, predict not, uh, taken t star n, predict not taken, NT star, and then predict not taken here. So what this means is we have a case where we initially, if we if we predict to it, we're going to take the branch, meaning we're actually going to go past the code, and we're right, we're pre, right the previous stage, we're here. <clears throat> if we say we want to, so we write the previous stage, but then let's say we predict taken and it ends up not being taken. We go to the second stage here. Which means, okay, let me scroll up here. So this is the branch prediction finite state machine. So odds are good that if you're going to be taking a lot of branches, you know, you'll be up here. So if you correctly predicted last time, we'll say in this state. However, if let's say it wasn't taken once and we guessed wrong, 
So this red means it was not taken. So we figured out after execution, oh, we need to go back. Then we go to the second state, T star red. But still, if we uh, predict taken it was taken again, we're going to go back to this state. So if we're in state 0, 0, predict taken, we predict taken for the next branch. It was not, turns out we were wrong. Well, then we're going to go to state 0, 1, which is this one, TSRN. <laughs> so then what happens is, if we actually need to go back, uh, it's a little bigger. There, that should be better. Okay, so what's going to happen is, let me read this first part of the TGO. Maintain a branch prediction buffer, branch history table, recording last behavior of the branch. So last behavior of the branch means we predicted it was going to be taken. It was taken, 0, 0. We predicted taken, it was actually not taken, 0, 1. Yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> so, if we have not taken, meaning that Liam Neeson did in fact get his daughter in the movie, um, eventually, yeah, so there we go. I hunt you down, I will find you, and I will kill you. Liam Neeson is always in this state, because no one's ever <laughs> taken for too long. <laughs> Liam, I have taken... The hostage, Liam Neeson's like, no, you didn't. I found you. <laughs> so there we go. So now we're always in predict not taking. This is the Liam Neeson state right here. And this is the, what's the French people that tried to stop it? That's going on the exam. That's going on the exam. Now, that'll, that'll give me a good chuckle. Okay, so, so this, but this is the way it works. So this concept of hysteresis, using this two-bit branch prediction buffer, means that we'll be able to say, based on the previous value, let's say I get to a branch, and I... And currently in this state, predict not taken, n star t. If it's not taken again, that means it's we're kind of in these states where we're strongly not taken, right? But if we end up taking it, we go back to taken. T star. So, so it could start at any one of those points. Correct. It's simply going to start at branch taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like any other finite in the state machine, you're going to have an initial state. So what, kind of going all the way back to section one, what type of uh, finite state machine is this? Really, or more. Which? More. Yeah, it's just, it's just, no, it's just a traversal state. If it's not, you just go here. So it'll be more. If it's zero, you just go to state zero one. Yeah, so it's a more state machine. Yeah, it's more. Yes? Um, well, this is kind of unrelated, but on the video last night, mm -hmm. it was like shifted to the right or That's something. correct. Way to go, Thomas. Okay. <laughs> I have a remote here. <laughs> okay. Well, this is the wrong time to bring that up, but sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want your paper. Oh, no. This, now that now that's on the right screen resolution. I had some Wait, class. <laughs> is, I, I was describing this before class. It was like, you know, some yeah, with the visual video oh, resolution. Man. It's all good. Sometimes it's like when you're raising kids. I don't have any kids. I don't know if any, any of you do, but sometimes you just, they like, I want to touch the stove. I was like, nope, good. Okay. No, no. It's like sometimes you just gotta let the kid touch the stove and go, ow, my hand, or I can't see the right side of the screen. So. But now it's on the right screen resolution. Well, that's how it was before you didn't say that. All right. It's, it's, it's all good. It's about holding against anybody. Anyway, back to the diagram. Back to the diagram where Liam Neeson kills people. So, okay, so we're, we're, at, a, we're at a weird point. Okay, so, so here's an example problem. So we're going to use, so on an exam, what I could ask you is, come draw all the finite state machine for a two-bit branch prediction buffer, and that'll give you a set of transitions, and then we're going to go through and figure them out. So, yep, change these all out. So let's go through and actually 
C. So we start at n, right? So we have given the two branch prediction method with an initial state of n star. So I will indicate on the exam where I want you to start. Hopefully you guys, this is putting everything together. So this is a good combining concepts question. You're learning about, you're describing you understand multi-processing, you're describing you understand branching, and you're describing you understand from section one uh, finite stages. So we start at n, right? We're here. N star. And we predict, so we're going to predict not taken when we're here. So if we actually are not going to take the branch, where do we end up? We're going to stay at the same state, right? So that, that first value n here, this value here. We start at n star and go to n. You're correct. I'm just going to go through here and delete these all so that we can. And then let's make it all so you can see. All right, so again, we're at n star. The actual, we're not, we're not taking the branch, right? So what do we do? Yep. We're not going to, so predicted, and we're going to go back to n star, right? So if we're n star, right, so what are we doing? Are we predicting or not predicting? I don't know why it deleted. I'll just delete these two, since I'm giving away the answer here. Okay, so if it's at if we're at n star, so we predicted not taken. So what are we actually predicting? What are we if we're at this state? What are we predicting? Are we predicting taken or not taken? Not taken. Were we correct? Actually, we're supposed to take it. No. So where do we go? Yep. And star t. So we predicted n. Turns out it was wrong t. We go to n star t. So now we're at n star t. So what we what are we going to predict? Are we going to predict taken or not taken? If we're in predict not and a not if we're in n star t. Yeah, predict not taken here, right? So we're going to predict not taken. And we were wrong, so now where do we end up? Correct. So now we're in the predict taken state. So what are we going to predict? Taken. taken. What are we right? So what does that mean? Where do we go to now? So we're here. T star n. Very good. This is. So here, we're at T star n. What do we predict? Taken. Did we? Were we right? No. No. Yeah. And. So now where are we at? Um, not taken. Not n star. What are we what are we gonna predict? Not taken. Not taken. Were we right? No. Nope. So where are we at now? Not so what are we gonna predict? Not taken. Were we right? Yes. So what does that mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. N star. And then predict not taken. We could go on forever. Now, this is kind of, this example is deliberately designed to be wrong a lot, so I can, you can demonstrate that you understand how to traverse through the finite state machine. In most cases, you're actually going to stay here or stay here for an overwhelming majority of the calculations, because if you're going to be, you're either going to be, let's say you're doing a while loop, and say you do a while to 100, and you predict and then you end up here and predict not taken, that means you're going to be stay doing the code again. So if you're doing it 100 times, you're going to be in this n star state 99 times, and then you'll only be wrong once. Right. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so we're now we're going to talk about multi-threading. So this will be, yeah. 
So the idea, there are three types that we're going to discuss. So briefly discuss multi-threading and describe the three types of multi-threading. Briefly assess it. Performing multiple threads of execution in parallel. So we kind of alluded to that area with thread level parallelism, right? So by doing that, we replicate registers, the program counter, et cetera. So for example, let me, I'm going to scroll up here for a second. We're going to text this example earlier. We have the processors. They each have their own registers. They each have their instruction memory, data memory, control unit. Then you have their memory hierarchy, data memory here. We have I.O., we have a directory, and so we're going to duplicate each of that in a multiprocessor environment. So back to where we were before. So this permits fast switching between threads. I'll get to your question in a second. Because if we have to allocate a certain process to a certain processor, I mean, if we have, like, the diagram I just showed you, it had eight processors, but let's say I need to run 32 threads. Well, the processor is going to be swapping memory out of the disk into the memory, and then the memory is going to perform the cache swapping, and then allocating new processor. If we only have one processor, then you have to take everything in and take everything out, whereas you only have to take something out of a processor when you absolutely have to, because we have eight running in parallel. Mike, what's your question? Is this kind of like how the like, Intel hyperthreading works for like, the i7s and stuff? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to make this font bigger. There we go. That's better. OK, so there's two. So we're going to talk about fine grain <coughs> multi-threading, coarse grain multi-threading, and simultaneous multi-threading. So fine grain multi-threading is we switch threads after each cycle. So we have a number of, so let's say in this diagram I'm going to show you down here, we have four threads, and we're going to have we're going to just try to allocate in certain ways. So in each cycle for fine grain threads, we're going to switch from one thread to another thread. We're going to interleave instruction execution, meaning that we're going to have cases where we'll have one set of instru uh, instructions each cycle being done in a particular thread. The next cycle, we'll be doing a different thread. So we have threads A, B, C, and D. Cycle zero we'll do thread A, cycle one we'll do thread B, cycle two we'll do thread C, cycle three we'll do thread D, cycle four we'll go back to A. And I'll keep going through that way. So that's what's known as fine grain multi-threading. Now the drawback, I'm sorry, not the drawback. So if one thread stalls, right, you get an instruction stall. We have an execution or an interrupt in one of the processes. <coughs> so the control unit says, well, if it's install, I have, I have a no-op, I you know, perform that store word operation and set everything up to the operating system, right? Well, so I have one thread stalled. Well, then the operating system is just going to allocate the other seven processors, like in the diagram, to the, to the thread, so that way you can continue to go faster, right? Now, coarse screen multi-threading, you're going to only switch on a long stall. So anything involving a level two cache or higher, right? So if I'm going to level one cache, miss is not really going to be that long because we know it's short. But remember, going back to average memory access time, the higher I have to go into the cache level, the longer the miss is. So if I get a miss, I can automatically, well, while I'm doing that, I can allocate the processor to another one. And then it updates it. And then the moment another L2 cache miss, occurs, then you can switch the threads back. So only switch on long stalls, for example, well to cache miss. Simplifies hardware. So the hardware required for fine grain multi-threading is more complex. However, it doesn't hide shorter stalls. So the data hazards, right? So if I get a stall on fine grain multi-threading, I can just immediately put in one in a new cycle, right? And if we get down to the instance where we have data forwarding units and hazard detection units, we can actually have a case where 
remember the we only had to insert stalls and one stall for load order operations and everything else kind of worked fine. And if we didn't do that, we had to insert two stalls essentially every cycle to wait for that update. So this doesn't hide that for screen multi-thread. Because if you got a stall, well, it's going to wait until a cache miss. Data hazards aren't cache misses. They have to wait, they're going to insert no ops before you can update the local register copies. But it's not a miss, it's because it's, you know, it's actually physically there, it just has to wait for it to be updated. So in simultaneous multi-threading, it's a dynamically scheduled processor. Schedule instructions from multiple threads. Instructions from independent threads execute when the function units are available. And within threads, dependencies are handled by schedule and register renaming. So we're not really getting into the concept of register renaming in this course this semester. But the idea is, let's say you know you had a data hazard, and you had to wait on another instruction. And if you have another processor, that becomes an issue. Especially if we're doing loops. Like you know, if you're have a if you're doing a loop and you're up. You do the comparison, and then you're doing values, but then you have this value of I plus plus in there incrementing. Well, what happens if that causes a data hazard? Well, you can take the concept of register renaming and creating a second register copy of that value, and you can have that update every other loop, so that way that data hazard is eliminated. So. That, that's a concept of Thomas Sulo's algorithm, which we're not going to get into. But the general idea, and we can, I can kind of show you an example down here, and I'll, then I'll go back up to the uh, simultaneous multi-threading. So this is uh, an example here of four threads. So thread A has executions from one, two, three, four, and five, and then it has a stall, and then does work here. Thread B has some execution time, another stall, and has some execution time. Thread C, cycle one cycle, stall, work. Th thread D has one element, a stall, and then more work. So in course screen, what this means is I'm going to go to the first thread until I have to go to some sort of, uh, not, I'm sorry, stall isn't the right word, level two cache miss <coughs> or data memory access. So course screen, I'm going to do all of thread A. You can see that what's being done here. And then once I get a stall, then I go to all thread B. If it continued, we would be going, it would hit this uh, cache miss here, and then do all of thread C. And then once we hit this, it would go to thread D instead of having to wait this time. And then once it did that, it would go back to A. Does that make sense? In fine grain multi threading, it goes through every cycle. So cycle one is going to be these two blocks. You can see right here, this is what's occurring. Cycle two, it's these three blocks. This is what's going on here. Thread C, then thread D, so you can see. And then next we'll do thread A, one. Thread D, two, right? And then <coughs> empty. So it goes right to thread three. So it's working there. Now, simultaneous multi-threading is going to try to use all four as much as possible. So going back to the definition of simultaneous multi-threading, schedule instructions from multiple threads. So in coarse green and fine green, we're only doing one thread across the multiple processors. In simultaneous multi-threading, we're doing multiple threads if we have the processors to do it. So the whole goal is to try to use as much as possible here. So instructions from independent threads when function units are available, meaning that, for example, we have four, and the first thread has two from A, right? And then two from B. I mean, so we have three from B, but we only have four processors. So we're going to do all two from A, and then the first two from B. And then the next cycle, the first thing it's going to do is go to the first, the remaining one from thread B. And then we have three left. Well, thread C just happens to have three, so it's going to do those. And then the next thing it's going to do is going to do one, one, and two. One, one, and two. Okay. For those of you watching the video, one is thread D, two is thread A, so that's 
this one and this one, and that's going to do the other two from thread B. So that's simultaneous multi-threading. So within threads, dependencies are handled, handled by scheduling and register renaming. Yes. Yes. That's exactly how it's done. <clears throat> so um, now we're going to talk about single issue versus multiple issue data. SIMD versus MIMD. SIMD stands for single issue multiple data, or MIMD stands for multiple issue multiple data. So this program has one copy stored in memory, whereas an MIMD, each processor has its own copy. So single issue, multiple issue. Single issue, one of them has it's stored in the main memory. So if you ever try to do SIMD, if recall, like we are talking about uh, memory distribution, if we're trying to do SIMD, what kind of uh, memory distribution do you, would we want? Would we want every local processor to have its own copy of data memory, or do we want one block of data memory for SIMD? Mm -hmm. That makes sense, because one copy is stored in memory. What about MIMD? That's correct. So here's how the operation works. Processors operate synchros synchronously on one program. So all the processors have one copy of data memory of one program, right? Whereas in MIMD, multiple issue, multiple data, processors act asynchronously on multiple programs, but processors can be used like SIMD. So if for whatever reason you felt <laughs> as though multiple processors need to be allocated to one thread, you could do that in an MIMD system to kind of have it work as a pseudo SIMD but each local processor is going to have a, a copy of its own variables. So then you have to worry about cache coherence. So then you're going to have a directory protocol, and then you're going to have a snoopy bus to keep track of those. Now, the advantage is if you're just doing it from two of them, the snoopy bus doesn't have to worry about the other six. Let's say if we have eight core, and it's only running on two threads, the snoopy bus only has to keep track of the directories of those two processors to have it kind of work as an SIMD. Whereas if the other six processors were doing their own threads, kind of like if we were taking a uh, simultaneous multi-threading approach, then the directory's not working as hard, doesn't have to perform as many stalls and write through and validates. Instruction decoding. One instruction from the decode from the control unit. So we have multiple processors, but we have one issued instruction. So then each processor in the MIMD is contains its own instruction decoder. So if you're doing an SIMD, you're going to have multiple operations running on these things. You have, again, ALU, registers, data memory. So loop handling. So loop handling is where we are talking about branch prediction, right? One control unit handles increment and decrement. So if you, whatever you're going to have, if you're going to do a loop, it's going to be a while loop or a for loop, you have to have some variable in there that you're using to increment and decrement to determine whether or not you want to stay in the loop or not. So you're going to have one processor doing that with one control unit, while each other processor does the computation. So you would want to be doing one where you have this operate, this, this processor is doing, is deciding, I'm going to increment. Then this processor is going to say, well, we're incrementing. I want to do that. Then this processor is doing another function within that loop. So then what happens if we have, say we predict not taking, meaning we're going to have this processor to do the code. Then what's going to happen is we're going to have to re go back through and go, you know, if we realize we predicted wrong, then the uh, operating system is going to have to say, hey, we predicted taken, we need to go back to your previous values using the reordering buffer, and then you go back to where we were and then continue operation. 
And each instruction decoder in MIND decodes just like you had in our data path. It was opcode, RS, RT, RD. Each individual processor has that. Um, no, I'm sorry, so we were talking about the end. Each processor increments, compares, and computes. So each processor has its own jump instruction. Each processor has its own branch instruction. Each processor has its own ALU. Each processor acts as if it was is a unique processor. Meaning it acts independently and only stops when the operating system tells it to. And interprocessor communication. So the other things we have to talk about before, we're talking about what does the program actually do? I have one program copy, operation, all the processors are working on one. In MIMD, I can do simultaneous multi-threading, or I can do coarse or fine-grained multi-threading. Instruction decoding. One instruction decoder in a control unit, that one has multiple. Loop handling. We have multiple, well, some processor does some part of the loop, another processor does another part of the loop in SIMD. In MIMD, each processor increments, compares, and computes. So now we have to worry about this interprocessor communication. Communication operations are automatically synchronized in SIMD. And this is because all of them are doing one program, right? So we have to make sure that when something wants to do something, you're basically doing a lot of hazard detection checking and making sure you know, and uh, maintaining cache coherency. In MIMD, you need explicit synchronization and identification protocol. Now, this is a huge operating systems problem. And if you take an operating system, of course, this is where a good chunk of, there's a lot of work that's done here on this. But what you need to know is that there actually has to be additional hardware, additional software to be able to manage multiple issue, multiple data. But as we were talking about yesterday, especially in uh, systems where you're rendering graphics, you want to take advantage of MIMD. You want it to be massively parallel. So does anybody have any uh, questions on this? Yeah. Correct. A level of communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there has to be like let's say yeah. you know all all of you in the front row are independent processors and you're all doing your own thing, but you need so, an yeah. operating system, a boss to indicate you're, you're taking some, you're just taking very <coughs> of working on these on this program together. You three are working on this program together, and you're working on this program. And so that has that has to be explicitly done. Whereas with SIMD, I, the only thing that's unique is I have my, it happens to all of us. Um, I, I did a lecture once where somebody had like uh, Lady Gaga's Bad Romance is their theme song. And it went off and I just started dancing and the moment it was over I just went right back to lecture. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so what I would, as I would have the local copy of the program and then we'd say, all right, what well, loop? So you increment the loop, you do what's in the loop, you take care of this function, you take care of this function, and then I would say, oh wait, oh, oh we predicted wrong, so I have to reorder everything and then go back to it. Any other questions on this? So we started at 7 yeah. Alright, so last section of the course. Woo! Storage and I.O. So up to this point, we talked about the process. So we started out kind of um, actually this is a this would be a good opportunity to kind of go over this. So since this is the last section, I want to take this opportunity to discuss what you guys have accomplished. Uh, you guys and lady have accomplished in this course compared to your contemporaries in other classes across the country. So 
and this is important because now we're at IO. So the that's obnoxious. Okay, so let's bring it over here. Okay, so the comparisons I've done, this is what you guys have done this semester. This is Mississippi State. This is when I took computer architecture at the University of South Florida. And these are the previously top two ranked in the country of these courses. So this is Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the University of Maryland. All three of these classes were three credit courses. Um, most of them, you remember combinational logic gates, sequential logic, finite state machines, risk versus CIS, computation performance, throughput, MDAL's law. Remember Gasky and CAN chart, that chart that had all the different levels of in, when we went over in VHDL. Input gate cost and Shannon expansion. Fixed length encoding numbers, that's just 32 bits. Um, MIT went into a little bit about variable length encoding. That's kind of what you can... We, talked about that very briefly in CIS. You know how in RISC you can actually have 32 bits, <laughs> but in CIS you can... Actually, that's they, that's a pretty much what they did too. Okay, so <laughs> error checking, going through your code and actually looking at a simulation and being able to figure out where your error is in the process of doing that. Uh, that was also done at the University of Maryland. Uh, I didn't go over voltages or wires or CMOS because I specifically, remember at the beginning of system, we did SSI, <laughs> MSI, LSI, and VLSI. I specifically limited this course to MSI versus VLSI. And all of this kind of goes into the transistor level. If you want to take my 482 ELE class next semester, nope. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> no. That electronic circuit so isn't a prerequisite for it if we're in here, is it? Correct. You, you, just, you just need a waiver from me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're not failing this class. <laughs> so VHDL, uh, we're the only class in the country to actually go into IEEE standards and motivations and modeling. Um, 1164, <laughs> but everything else is kind of covered in projects. Computing arithmetic. We didn't really go into serial and bit slice multiplication, but we did do sign multiplication. Um, floating point multiplication. We didn't do floating point multiplication. And every <laughs> class, of course, designs their arithmetic logic units. Uh, just like MIT, we all did the same finite state machine stuff. Um, we didn't really go into stacks and procedures. I was kind of planning on doing it, but I just wanted to focus more on coding principles after I could, got feedback from you about uh, course material. Um, but obviously went over principal locality, cache misses and hits, average memory access time, memory hierarchy, direct map and set associative caches, memory addressing modes, load word and store word, all that pseudo addressing, right, improving cache throughput, right through and right back. Processors, so most this is where most of the classes are very similar. Um, we don't want to really in depth into what's actually on the MIP screen sheet. Um, Functions and registers, software abs software abstraction. That's kind of going more depth into the operating system level, so we didn't cover that. Um, I did no other class did function pointers. I want to do that because I got feedback from you about we were actually what is a function pointer? What's C? What is this magical code? So I wanted to actually teach you guys what's physically be done here. Data structures and data memory. You learned that. Uh, loop Im implementation, branch jump. Uh, we did not, we're not going to be going over a Turing machine this semester, uh, and then data forwarding. Virtual memory, this is what we just went over, address translation, page tables, trend TLB, disk storage, and handling page faults. For I.O., um, I didn't go into semaphores, bounded buffers, deadlock, or how we're going to be using DVRs, DVDs, and all that, because these are kind of in-depth operating systems issues. Um, but we did. We are going to be going over uh, for the rest of the semester about dependability, reliability, and availability, non-volatile storage, buses, pulled interrupt and driven interrupt-driven I/O, and then RAID arrays, and then multiprocessing. What we just did, um, Thomas Sulo's algorithm. I skipped that this semester. Um, that was done at Mississippi State, but that was kind of going into what you were just asking about. How to, what happens when we want to do the variable renaming? Um, I wanted to focus more on uh, fundamentals and coding.
So that's why I didn't do that. But we did do we did just do TLP versus ILP, coarse fine grain simultaneous multi-threading. Uh, branch prediction, cache coherence. Um, VLIW is just, hey, instead of 32, let's make it 128 bits. And how can you make that occur? Super scalar and super pipelining. Well, we didn't cover it explicitly. I did talk about what that was, is just breaking the uh, stages into as much as possible. And then node networks, what happens if you have multiple computers in a node? How do you distribute communication? So we didn't cover that. Um, we talked about power, future implementation technology, and pipelining issues, data forwarding, hazard detection. And then for coding projects, um, we didn't do HSpice because HSpice is a programming language that simulates at the transistor level up. Uh, we did VHDL. Uh, we also did not do a Turing machine, but we did do everything else. And so the final projects here and uh, MIT and University of Maryland all did the MIPSB VHDL. Um, Mississippi State, for whatever reason, decided to implement it in C, which I thought was a cop out. <laughs> and uh, so the reason I'm showing you this, uh, I'll get, like, what's your question? No, no, go ahead, ask it. It's okay. It's, this is this is part of me being open and accountable. So. It's like floating away from me right now. I can't quite remember. We're close to Thanksgiving break. It's that time. Do you have a question? Uh, can you actually like post like? This is on Blackboard. Yeah. Well, no, no, I'm about to say like the Turing example. Like. Yeah, sure. I can do that. I'd be more than happy. I mean, there, uh, we can just. I can actually uh, grab a, a small set if you want to read into that. Um, the reason I do this is because I, you know, if you recall at the beginning of the semester, I jumped up and I said that you guys could potentially be the best uh, advanced digital systems course in the country. And <laughs> I found, and you're like, what? And I found these are allegedly the best two year in and year out, right? And these are your contemporaries who everybody, oh, Mississippi State's the better engineering school. Well, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. So. I know I push you guys, but these are things like, you know, I have a set of things you can put on a resume, and I want you to know that no matter what anybody says to you, you guys outwork the MIT kids, you outwork the University of Maryland kids, you outwork the Mississippi State kids, you definitely outwork the USF kids. This is when I took this course, which means I taught myself a lot of this information. <laughs> um, there you go. That's what you covered this semester, and you guys should be very proud of yourself. So we got one last section after I hit Adam's question. Okay. Uh, how common is Verilog compared to VHDL? Ooh, that's a that is a good question. So in there, Verilog VHDL was the original standard, and Verilog kind of came around. I want to say 1994 or 1995 um, as a way to try to address uh, implementation of certain technologies. So. VHDL is supposed to be a standard that you can implement down to any LSI uh, circuit. So, whereas Verilog, uh, you can actually just physically code in past transistors and actual trans, uh, I get it, uh, tri state buffers, and actually try to implement at that level. So, any other questions? Okay, so. Let's kind of briefly go over I.O. So up to this point, we've done all of that, what I just showed you. But the one <laughs> thing we haven't done yet in this course is talk about how, well, how do you get all this information. We've done all this processing. Eventually, you need to see it, right? You need to see it on your computer screen. You need to be able to tell the computer what to do through keyboard, mouse. If it does everything but you can't use it, what's the point? So we're going to learn briefly about storage and I.O. So this is kind of a general overview of a computing system. So you learned so far about processor, you learned about the cache, you learned about this memory interconnect, you learned about how interrupts are driven through the operating system, you learned about main memory, and so now we're going to talk about I.O. IO control. So the processor memory bus, so that's this, is a bus that is short, high speed, and match the memory system as to maximize memory processor bandwidth. So the whole thing is you want this to go as fast as possible, right? 
We're talking about gaming. We want the gaming to render as fast as possible. We have this massively parallel computing system that calculates all the different sprites, right? What these values need to be and how they're moving around. Output. But you also need to be able to communicate to the computer screen rapidly as well. If it's not done, then you get lag time. So you need that bus to be high speed. If it's running slower, then you can't see the guy coming around to shoot you in the game, not in real life. But can't stress that enough. Can't stress that enough. Please, please leave all that in the video game. Liam Neeson did that in a movie. <laughs> so now a backplane bus is a bus that's specifically designed to allow processors, memory, and I.O. devices to coexist on a single bus. Let me scroll up here so you can read the actual thing. So an I.O. transaction is a sequence of, oh, I'm sorry, let me go back to backplane bus. So the backplane bus is something that communicates with everything. So it's kind of ruled by the operating system. And it's saying, all right, I'm going to allocate the processor. I'm going to allocate. You're going to be taking care of your, my uh, computer screen, your, my mouse, your, my keyboard. And then I have to regulate communication. So if a keyboard comes in, someone presses a key. Well, it's to say, I just pressed J. All right, well, what does J mean? I go over to my processor. What are we actually running? I'm running a Word doc. I'm running Microsoft Word. OK. So that means what I have to do is I have to update my document in memory to say J. Well, now I also need the viewer to see it. So now I go to my computer screen, put J there. OK, cool. Now we're done. And so this is going to happen through a series of what's known as I.O. transactions. The I.O. transaction is a sequence of operations over the interconnect that includes a request and may include a response, which may carry data. So I just described an I.O. transaction. Keyboard, pressing something. I press G. Hey, I have information to give you. OK. So I would go to the back plane bus. And we perform this I.O. transaction. So in this case, what's going to happen is as the bus is being used, well, if you're another processor and you want to communicate, you've got to wait until I <laughs> give them the information and then I find out what I need to do so that I'm communicating make sure that we can make this run as fast as possible. So I don't want to block things. Let's say I'm doing J, but then I'm also running music on my computer, right? So you guys listen to music a lot while you're studying. If you're typing everything, well, you don't want to be like every time you type a keyboard to like, so the bomb now wait because I am typing, right? You don't want that to happen with the song continuous to play. So while it's doing that, I also have to ensure that the music is flowing to the speakers, which is another I.O. device. So I have to coordinate. So just on this laptop, for example, I have a computer screen, I have a touch screen, I have a mouse. I have a keyboard, I have a video screen, I have a video that takes the videos up here, so I have to wait for all of this, and I have all the USB ports, I have an Ethernet port, I have a VGA cable. So we can go through here and we can see all of these. Now these I.O. transactions in these buses have to ensure that I can all do this rapidly. So see, as you can see, I have the mouse, and let's say I, got, I want to delete G now. So if I want to delete G and save, so what happened when I did that? I deleted G. I went to the processor that's running the Word document. I want to get rid of that. OK, I've deleted. Local copy, I've deleted that as well. Now I press save. Well, I press save. I'm saving it to the USB. And I'm doing that all with the mouse, which means everywhere the mouse goes, it has to know where the location is. It has to know where to render it on the screen. So it's communicating on the screen, and it has to be able to know where, if I click here, what does that actually do in the other processor, right? So if I click there with the mouse on that part of the screen, what does that actually tell the other process to do? So that all is taken care of with the operating system through this bus, and it's all done rapidly. So a synchronous bus 
includes a clock in the control lines, as well as a fixed protocol for communicating that is relative to the clock. So we have our clock signal. Clock one, you want something. Okay, that means you wait till the second clock before he can receive or do an IO transaction. So clock occurs, first one, you have to wait. Next clock, okay, it's your turn. Yes? When you say that they have, that it includes the clock, is it? Is there one clock for the whole computer that just like that one signal is used, or is it? Well, it's, this is okay. So this is a concept of clock distribution. So yes, there is one clock. And do any of you know how a clock is actually physically generated in the computer? Is the like a PC that you know, like an actual? Well, it's. I mean, at, at that level, it's not quite a cesium atom. It's not an atom. It is a crystal. Okay. Wait. So then, oh, this is a little off topic. We got time. So the whole idea is you have a crystal. But, and then you actually putting a voltage across it. These crystals, I'll show you a question in a second. You put a voltage across them, and then what happens is they vibrate. And once they begin to vibrate, they actually will vibrate at a consistent speed, and that vibration actually gives off current. And that current then goes into your computer. So that's how the clock is generated. And they use clock dividers based on you know the, the specific operating speed. So you're not gonna, you don't need a two gigahertz clock for any mouse. So you don't need two gigahertz clocks for a computer. Adam. Um, so do they use? Is it basically how the same kind of in a watch? How they use quartz? And yes. Like the Tyco material. Exactly. Like, okay. Exactly right. What kind of crystal? I forget exactly. Do they ever have mechanical clocks, kind of like the mechanical watches that don't, you know, that wind up? Instead of using quartz. Right, but it, it'd be, that would limit the operating speed of your processor because mm -hmm. the mechanical can only go so fast. Right. And if it's, you know, you were trying to get 2 gigahertz or 2.8 gigahertz, then that's very limited for the mechanical. Right. Yes, sir. Um, I'll ask the You say the voltage going into a crystal and then it's vibrating. Mm -hmm. like, assuming you don't change the voltage, like, how would you change like the clock speed? Like I my oh, then you use a clock divider. Okay, you guys actually have written some code that can do this. You're going to use a master safe flip flop. If you recall from the master safe flip flop, you have you know, your one clock, right? And then it has to wait until the second flip flop, so it has to go up and down. So then it has to wait until this next one. So it'll go. So now you've cut the clock in half. Okay. <laughs> Mind blown. Okay, so now an asynchronous in interconnect uses a handshaking protocol. Let me read this for you. For co coordinating usage, instead of using a clock, which can accommodate a variety <laughs> of devices and speeds. So, as I allude to, not everything's going to work at 2 gigahertz. Certain things work at 500 megahertz, and they don't really need to run any faster. Well, if I have a computer, there's no guarantee that any given moment it's going to work on the clock, right? So I press G. Am I going to press it at the exact moment of a of a positive edge trigger? Not necessarily. Odds are good that I'm actually going to press it if I'm a human I'm pressing it. And it's going to take you know millions of them because it's two gigahertz and I'm holding it down for like a half second, right? So how do I do this handshaking protocol to ensure that if I press G it's only one G, right? As opposed to, you know, thousand Gs. How do you ensure that? How am I going to reach these keys? <laughs> okay, so how do I how do I do that? We use a handshaking protocol. So I need to act, so what's physically going on is the keyboard works in a Kind of a graph like this. And so when you press a, a letter, it's going to automatically select this one. And what's going to happen is, as it's going through, it's going to do this handshaking protocol. Do you have something? Do you have something? Do you have something? No. As it goes through, it's going to say, do you have something? Yes. And it's going to, by coordinate this mapping, it's then going to send off a binary value, an ASCII value, to the processor with which 
it sends across this bus, this interconnection bus, to do with the processor what it's going to do. So sometimes asynchronous is better because that's the moment I don't really need to check it until you actually have something for me, right? Whereas, whereas other pr processes, I need to constantly ask. So we're going to be going to this concept called pulled versus interrupt-driven I.O. For a pulled, inter pulled I.O., it's going to be, I'm going to ask you, do you have something, do you have something, do you have something, do you have something, do you have something? Whereas interrupt-driven is, like you guys ask some questions in class. I'll be going and you guys will interrupt, raise your hand, and I'll ask you your question. That's interrupt-driven I.O. I'm going to be the quickest to know. Depends. It's quick, it's quick, but sometimes you don't, I don't need to constantly ask, like if I have a printer hooked up to the computer, right? Do I have to constantly ask the printer for something? That's a waste of computing resources. Sometimes you just want the printer to go, hey, I've got something. So for the things that you really can't miss, you use the, what was it? The, Both. The same yeah. mm -hmm. For things like printers and a mouse, you use an Exactly printer. right. Good. So now that you're now the, uh, covering, what's that? Would the display be synchronous or asynchronous? Well, you, you want it to be synchronous because every clock you're updating. See, I, every time I'm moving this mouse? Right. So you, you, you're going to be going through and rendering every sprite as you go through. So now you want that to happen as quickly as possible. The LCD controller is in charge of that? Yes. So. That's good. Any other questions? Okay, so the I.O., the operating system, is shared. the I.O. system is shared by multiple programs, which makes sense. Uh, interrupts must be handled by the operating system because they cause a transfer to supervisor mode. So at the processor level, we now have an interrupt. Something happened. We had bad code. I had bad op code. Well, now you go to the operating system and say, Hey, I you send it up through the store where the operating system takes care of business. Well, while it's doing that, there are other processes that may depend on it. Right? So the operating system has to fix that, and then we go down to simultaneous multi -threading. Well, while he's not doing something, you can't, you can't, you can't try to maintain the uh, processor speed and maintain performance until you run into an instance where you have a hazard, or you have to absolutely wait. The low-level control of an I.O. design is used, managed using a set of concurrent events, which we kind of just talked about, and the requirements for the correct device are very detailed. So you're going to have an exact speed, like we were just talking about, with uh, clock dividers. So if we're doing a, a synchronous protocol, you have to know precisely how fast the clock is going. So you're going to have a little bit of delay, and this is why I emphasize delay in VHDL, because you want to ensure that all of your speeds are working properly. When you're in 386 and you're working with I.O. devices, one thing you're going to get frustrated with is, wait, I, I, I swear this code is right. What probably happened is you didn't make sure that you followed all of the details in the data sheet about the device you're sending it to. Okay. So I was kind of alluding earlier about the you press G and get like 20 Gs. The reason why is because you're not properly ensuring the right clock speed. So what happens is you say that the clock speed is, um, let's say, 1 megahertz, right? And it turns out it's actually 2 megahertz. So you press the key, it's supposed to get, it checks every 1 megahertz. Well, what happens, I mean, you have one clock cycle, one, I'm sorry, one half of the clock cycle to allow for pressing the key, right? Well, on that one, you actually, if you misclock it, you can actually get two. So that's why you can get GG or F instead of just G. And when I was taking uh, embedded system design, uh, I was I joke with my uh, professor. I'd be like, can we just call this a human to hobo translator? Like, ah, ha, 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 hi. <laughs> I'm Matt Morrison. No, he didn't accept that. So we have to worry about proper timing. So that's why in the pro on the projects, I was always having to like make sure you're doing timing, make sure you know how fast the clock speed is going, because that's going to make three to six a lot easier for you. Thanks, 
So you have to provide protection to shared I.O. resources. You have to guarantee a user's program cannot access other processes I.O. So if he's doing a program, you can't let him go, oh, wait, I'm going to grab all your stuff too, right? So you have to provide some sort of shared protection. <laughs> you have to handle the interrupts generated by I.O. devices. So you have a printer, mouse, keyboard. Provide equitable access to the shared I.O. resources. So we want to worry about something like deadlock, where let's say Aaron's process, he comes in and he's like, I want something. And I have the bus until I'm done. Right? And then none of you can do anything. Well, that's, <laughs> well, that's the operating system. I was just going, mum, 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 not today. <laughs> so take that, give that to George, or give that to Thomas. Yes? What does the serial in USB actually mean? The universal serial bus for USB? What is mm. the serial? Oh, yeah. So basically, okay. So the whole idea is that you're actually communicating one L, one process at a time, right? So if you're, if I'm, uh, let's see if I'm at, let's see if I can go back to the section. So I have two elements open in my, from my USB, right? So I can, Update section eight, or if it decides it doesn't want to do it, not do it. Okay, so it's, that, no, that's going to be a bad example for what. <laughs> okay, so eventually you want to perform a uh, handshake protocol. We're saying, all right, give update the value on my USB, and then you can read and write to the USB. So it's serially. There's no, there's no parallel because there's no par parallel port. And so to accomplish all of this, we're going to do some, we're going to differentiate. Now I've just completely. Okay, so this is what we're end lecture for today. Hold and driven I.O. So your homework is going to be 7.28 through 8.7. So. Possibly. Okay, so polled I.O. is the process of periodically checking the status of an I.O. device to determine its need. So that's polling. It's like, do you need do you need the bus? 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 Next clock. Do you need the bus? 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 Next clock. Do you need the bus? And so forth. The I.O. device puts the information in a status register. And the I.O. periodically checks the status register. So in that middle of the clock, if let's say I'm already at Aaron, and while I'm at Aaron, Thomas realizes he needs it. So he's going to update the status register and say, hey, I have an update. So I'm going to go, hey, you need a clock, you need a clock. Next clock. Do you need it? And I'll check the status register. And it turns out he does. So that's when I get the information from him and we initiate the handshaking protocol. So interrupt-driven I.O. is an external event asynchronous to the instruction execution, but does not prevent instruction completion. So for example, I, there's a printer. If I press print, well, I don't want print to stop the music from playing, right? I don't want pressing print to stop the monitor. I don't want press while the computer is printing to, I can't use the keyboard all of a sudden. Whenever an I.O. device needs attention from the processor, it interrupts the processor. Hey, 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 Professor Morrison, I need you have a question. It's interrupt-driven I.O. Some processors deal with interrupts as special exceptions. So if you're getting a specific type of I.O. device, it actually will deal with it in a unique way. That's the handshaking protocol. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I should mention that if you if you go into interviews, especially if you're doing something with embedded systems, or now how many differences between pull, like, what are the two types of I/O, or what's the difference between pull and interrupt driven I/O? Is a very very common interview thing, that question. So this is something that will help you in job, trying to get a job in the future. So 
Does anybody have any questions before I dismiss the class? Example uh, 7.2. Oh, okay. That's correct. An example 7.2. All right. Well, if you come into class on Tuesday, good for you. I won't be here. Uh, have a good Thanksgiving break, and I'll see you in, uh, in two weeks. Two weeks? No, I mean, well, a week and a half, whatever. <laughs>